Um, wasn't there a magic raid that wasn't the first time the Wizards of uh, the Coast hired Pinkertons? Um, this is, uh, uh, I think Charlie did a video on this. Let's take a look at that. I know a lot of you love when I watch Moist Critical videos on here, especially Weeby, because every Moist Critical video implies that I'm not watching a fucking yet another dumbass Bill Maher video, which is very concerning for him. I was an extra. In what is this? YouTuber gets raided over trading card drama. Here it All is. All of you know I like to collect shiny trading cards. Yu-Gi-Oh! Pokemon, Magic the Gathering. There's just something about a holographic card that just activates all the neurons in my tiny little primitive smooth brain and makes me clap and have a smile on my face. Now, I've collected cards for a long time, and Wizards of the Coast has produced a lot of the cards I've collected, uh, early Pokemon sets and Magic the Gathering, for example. And what they've recently done to another collector is unforgivably cruel. They unleashed the fucking Pinkertons to go to this man's house and scare him and his wife and confiscate some Magic the Gathering booster boxes that he had recently purchased. That sounds like the plot to a Breaking Bad episode when someone didn't fully compensate Tuco for the drugs they bought. Now the reason there was an issue with his purchase is because the YouTuber made a video showcasing the boxes that he got and it turns out the boxes he received were not the ones that he actually ordered. He had ordered a booster box set called March of the Machine, but what he received was March of the Machine, The Aftermath, which was an unreleased set and he unveiled the cards a month early. It was a leak and it was a problem with the distribution because the names are so similar. He believes what happened is the person he tried to purchase March of the Machine boxes from accidentally- Oh, they should kill him. Yeah, that's how this works now. <laughs> America, baby. You know, <laughs> fuck it, YOLO, uh, like uh, perma jail. Oh, did we make a mistake? Uh, turns out it's your problem now. Accidentally sent him the unreleased boxes because the names were so similar and they got confused. But he didn't steal the product or anything like that. He didn't knowingly purchase unreleased product. He just got sent the wrong thing. But Wizards of the Coast, they took this as an affront to God. I'm sure all of you have heard the name Pinkertons before because they were literally the bad guys in Red Dead. Like, th they have existed for 170 years. I had no idea they were still around. I, I thought they went extinct like fucking 100 years ago. But they still currently operate today. And Wizards of the Coast dusted off the old hotline right to their, <laughs> right to their desk and ordered a, an operation for them. I'm not here to do a deep dive on the history of the Pinkertons. They engaged in a lot of terrifying shit a long time ago, and I don't know to what capacity they still operate and do business today, but just their reputation enough is horrifying, and the fact that Wizards of the Coast used them as their first means of communication with this YouTuber is frightening. As far as I know, Wizards of the Coast didn't make any attempts to directly communicate with the YouTuber to resolve the situation without making a big hoopla out of it. It seems they just immediately, like, slapped the Pinkertons on the ass and told them, get out there, sport. Time to engage Operation Pinkerton Pain Train. I do find it pretty funny that, like, Normie Jesus is, like, very aware of the Pinkertons being bad. For those of you who don't know, the Pinkertons are... You know, early formations of police, I guess, or private security. Maybe you know it from Red Dead, but they are the bad guys. They engaged in corporate espionage. They uh, destroyed uh, unions. They are, you know, they're just like private militia for corporations. Um, They're like cops with less restrained. Yeah, even worse. Let's watch the rest of the Charlie video and, and then we'll watch the And then sent the them Pinkerton. right to the man's doorstep. And when I was reading about... Yeah, Pinkertons are very real. Yes. Um, they also engaged in slave catching as well. Asset extraction. What? I don't like the Pinkertons. This show made me say... It made me say so many bad words. What was like a... God, that was such a good show. Did they use cock sucking all the time? Yeah, I was like... I think still to this day, I say cock sucking all the time because of the show. Like the amount of the, the, the sizable impact 
that, whoa, 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 uh-uh, no. Enough. Enough exploration. Enough. Done enough. She's literally eating the fucking Logitech USB cord that is the camera to the fucking puppy watch uh, camera. No. No. Click. No. Nope. No. Good girl. Good girl! Yeah, she's out here fucking taking out the cameras, dude. She's anti-CCTV. It's fucked up. Anyway, let's continue with this Charlie uh, video. Where the fuck was it? I lost it. ...about this story and watched the video the content creator posted about the situation, I immediately pictured Wizards of the Coast higher-ups donning these dark cloaks put over their head, kind of like Darth Sidious in Star Wars, sitting around this giant table like an Austin Powers supervillain lair, brainstorming on the best course of action to reclaim the stolen goods, even though it wasn't stolen. And they came up with the scariest option they could at the time. They, they treated this YouTuber, his name's Old School MTG, they treated him like Cobra Commander, and they were sending the G.I. Joe after him, all over a fucking trading card leak that the guy didn't even mean to engage in in the first place. Yes, he did film the opening of the Aftermath box, which was a leak and it was early, but they could have just asked him politely to like take it down and even ship back the product and they would maybe just give him what he meant to buy. This was clearly an issue in the distribution, not with the YouTuber himself. He didn't mean to, to buy this set because it wasn't out. He just wanted some March July machine 6, boxes and it became a big deal. So much so that it escalated to Wizards of the Coast sending the Pinkertons, which is just wild. You know, the, the, the title's not like a joke. The Pinkertons, and this is news to me, are still real. You know them as the bad guys in Red Dead, but they are like a real firm. So basically, in a nutshell, there is a YouTuber. I believe his name is Old School MT. Okay, this is the rest of it is like clips from the show, clips from the stream. So let's watch the history of the Pinkertons. Two. Homestead. Alan Pinkerton, the Knights of Capitalism. Extra history. Dead Pennsylvania. Just before dawn, thousands of striking workers surround the Homestead Steelworks. They have their families with them. Someone shouts. They turn. Two barges, loaded with 300 men of the Pinkerton National Detective Agency, float toward the riverbank. They've been hired by the chairman of the Carnegie Steel Company to disperse the striking workers, allowing the factory to reopen with non-union labor. The workers know exactly what to expect from the Pinkertons. They violently protected Western railroads from cult heroes like Jesse James, Butch Cassidy, and the Sundance Kid. They provided the damning but controversial evidence that sent non-union members to the gallows after the Haymarket Affair. And in Pennsylvania, Pinkertons had already been used as strike breakers during the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 and snuffed out the secret society of Irish coal miners known as the Molly Maguires. These were the mercenaries of the oligarchy, the Knights of Capitalism, and their carrying Winchester rifles. It's kind of funny to think that, like, I mean, they were literally cops before cops existed. Because remember, policing is so firmly built into our minds as this, like, profoundly important institution. But, like, the original organizational structure of the police wasn't a real thing. Like, there wasn't, like, actual... They had, like, a sheriff and then, uh, you know, the posse comitatus or whatever the fuck it's called. You know, they would have, like, slave catchers. They would have, like, a sheriff with, like, a bunch of other people who he had deputized. It was basically just, like... Like, they didn't actually have, like, a national or federal uh, or, or national or state-level, like, formation for the most part. They had, like, marshals and stuff. But, you know, they, they mostly had, like, bounty hunters, right? You just winged it? Isn't it? What, what is it called? Isn't it when you have a posse, there's, like, a term for it? Did I say it wrong? I don't know. Um, but, yeah, they were the fucking, you know, the first formation of the police pretty much. While I finish my food. Real quick up top, please welcome our fantastic guest writer for today's episode, Dr. Bob Whitaker, a professor who studies the history of law enforcement. He's also the creator of the awesome video and podcast series, History Respond, which invites historians to comment on historical games. So you should definitely check that out if you want to hear what actual historians think of everything from Assassin's Creed to the return of Obra Dinn. Thanks, Bob.
In America's Gilded Age, there was no greater friend to the robber baron and no worse enemy to the working man than the Pinkerton National Detective Agency. Yet the reputation of the Pinkertons stands in stark contrast to the history and politics of the agency's founder, Alan Pinkerton. The story of how a progressive working-class activist from Scotland founded an organization synonymous with ruthless capitalism represents one of the greatest paradoxes of American history. Born in Glasgow in 1819, Alan Pinkerton was part of a large family living in desperate poverty and spent most of his teenage years as a homeless, illiterate cooper. Like many underemployed British men, Pinkerton was soon caught- Come on, dog. This is like typical Scottish. Brilliant, innovative, absolute fucking dogs of the British. Dogs of the English. That sounds exactly like, don't get mad at me, but, you know, let's be real. Nah, Scots are left-wing, dude. Yeah, I mean, there are plenty who are, but- those Scottish people also absolutely know exactly who the fuck I'm talking about when I say there's plenty of Scottish people. There's plenty of Scottish people who do like being uh, the the working uh, rabid uh, hyenas of the English, some. Caught up in the major political movement of the age, Chartism. Named after the People's Charter of 1838, Chartism was a working class movement that pushed for universal male suffrage in Britain. And the pro Bro, I put her down and she fucking passed out instantaneously. Like, she is so incredibly passed out. Primary goal of Chartism beyond suffrage was to alleviate working class suffering related to unemployment and low wages. No goal made more sense to an impoverished Cooper living in the rough. So Pinkerton joined the Glasgow Universal Suffrage Association. And soon, he became one of the group's most vocal advocates of violence to achieve working class goals. And he backed up his words with action in 1839, when he traveled hundreds of miles to participate in a march on Newport. There, 10,000 Chartists descended on the Westgate Hotel, which was being used as a temporary jail for local Chartist leaders. Armed with homemade weapons, the Chartists engaged in a skirmish with British troops, leaving dozens dead and wounded. British authorities captured the leaders and transported them to penal colonies, while the remainder, including Pinkerton, escaped with arrest warrants dogging their steps. While on the run, Pinkerton reevaluated his situation. With Chartism reeling, there seemed no hope for him in Britain. And so, in 1842, with his new bride Joan, Pinkerton boarded a passenger ship to start a new life in North America. And with help from Chartist friends, Pinkerton was soon able to set up a barrel making business in Illinois. Having escaped poverty and arrest warrants back home in Scotland, the Pinkertons settled down to family life. Yet on his way to historical obscurity, something funny happened to Alan Pinkerton. In 1847, Pinkerton was searching an island in the Fox River for wood for his barrels. When he had as good as this channel is, I cannot overlook the fact that he said Illinois. No, that's uh, as much as I like to, as much as I like to fuck up state names. Okay, like Illinois. No. Okay, Mister Arkansas. Really? Yeah, not Illinois. Okay. No. Nevada, Arkansas, all of that makes sense. You can't do Illinois. Or that you refer to Scots as Scottish people. McSquack. Scots, not Scottish people. Shut up, McSquack. What is this? Kaya's own trading card? Kaya's Onslaught. Target creature gets plus one, plus one, and gains double strike until end of your turn. Foretell. During your turn, you may pay two, exile, uh, two and exile this card from your hand face down. Cast it on a later turn for it for its foretell cost. Your trail ends here. Uh, um, not redeemable at the top of the hour where there's a three-minute ad break. The only card you can use then is a $5 a month subscription card, uh, which you can use at the top of the hour to... Uh, Defeat the impacts of the three-minute ad break. Here is the three-minute ad break now. When there is ad break, there can be no freedom. But when there is freedom, there will be no ad break. Vladimir Kaya Lenin. All right, let's continue. Happened upon a counterfeiter's camp. Like all new territories and states in the Midwest, Illinois suffered from gangs of counterfeiters, which managed to flourish because federal currency laws... Or every time he says Illinois, I get... Like, it feels like it hits me in the face. 
I can't be alone on this. Also, I got to did not get extend to the new territories and counterfeit currency was especially a problem for immigrants like Pinkerton, whose unfamiliarity with the new money often led to getting swindled. So after discovering the camp, Pinkerton returned with the local sheriff and a band of deputized citizens. The posse descended on the camp, arrested the counterfeiters and destroyed their equipment. Following this episode, Pinkerton became a permanent sheriff's deputy. Yeah, that's right. The wanted chartist from Glasgow was now a lawman in the West. Counterfeiting pointed to a common issue faced by American law enforcement at this time, namely how to ward off criminal activity in a country that was growing both in geography and population beyond the means of the state. Because what recourse did a county sheriff have when criminals could just escape justice by simply leaving that sheriff's jurisdiction? And this issue was most evident on the railroads, which cut through multiple municipal and state jurisdictions and through areas with no legal structure at all. So seizing on an opportunity, Pinkerton began to develop a private police force that could protect westbound cargo. And thus, Pinkerton's National Detective Agency was born. Now, there was a bit of bravado involved in calling a Chicago-based company National. But the word was critically important to Alan Pinkerton's clients. They needed a police force that wasn't beholden to <sighs> local or state boundaries, and perhaps more importantly, wasn't subject to the corruption that afflicted police departments and sheriff's offices throughout the country. They also needed a force that could provide security without relying on badges or uniforms. In other words, plain-clothes detectives that could blend in with suspected criminal groups to gain intelligence. By 1860, Pinkerton's detective agency had lucrative retainers with six Midwestern railway companies based in Chicago. Most of their work with the railroad companies focused on testing railway employees. So interesting that they were the first formation of, like, federal law enforcement, um, you know. And what did they do? Why were they designed? What were they doing successfully? Oh, that's right. Corporate espionage. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. I mean, certainly, obviously, our federal law enforcement agencies now don't do that, right? I mean, they don't work as an entity, like as, a, as another arm of the government that is defending capital. Certainly not. No, that would be really weird. <clears throat> In this testing, a Pinkerton agent would pose as a criminal and offer conductors and station agents bribes in exchange for free rides or access to cargo. With the success of the Pinkerton Agency, Allen began enjoying a level of social prestige and financial security he had only dreamed of back in Scotland. And with this newfound This motherfucker literally did the once I get it once I see a bit of this money, this socialism shit socialism shit is over. Honey, Allen began to pursue another transportation project, the Underground Railroad. The Pinkerton family were ardent abolitionists, and their Chicago home became a way station for escaped slaves venturing north to Canada. In fact, Allen even hosted Never and mind. raised money for the wanted abolitionist John Brown in the run-up to Brown's famous raid on Harper's Ferry. And when the Civil War came in 1861, Pinkerton... Wait, this makes no fucking sense. I thought they did do... Guess you gotta take all the bad things you said about them back. No, I thought they did do acid extraction. Well, I guess this entire video is, like, literally about how... Um, <clears throat> this video is about how, like, this went so far away from their like it they they uh went so far away from their original intention but yeah dude there's literally okay i'm sure it's gonna get to it hold on and helped to foil an assassination attempt on his illinois acquaintance president-elect abraham lincoln in baltimore and also worked closely with general george mcclellan an old railway buddy to scout confederate troop movements bolstered by this association with wartime leaders pinkerton was able to expand his business in the post-war period Yet for all of Alan Pinkerton's fame as a defender of Chicago area immigrants, as a station master on the Underground Railroad, as the protector of Abraham Lincoln, and as the bane to vicious criminals like Jesse James, his agency was also inextricably linked to the defense of property and capital. As a private police force, the Pinkertons were not beholden to the will of the people, but instead the will of the highest bidder. And although much of their anti-union work happened after Alan Pinkerton's death, the anti-labor perspective of the agency was present at the very beginning of the organization, with the aforementioned testing of employees at train stations. But it just follows from having some guys in plain clothes doing stuff across jurisdictions. That's just the private secret police. No, that's precisely what it is. But it also predates, like, actual formations of the uh, federal law enforcement agencies. So that's why... Uh, <clears throat> 
I'm pretty sure that they literally did engage in slave patrols, but um, maybe I'm wrong. Like, am I am I misremembering this? Yeah, long before the Federal Bureau of Agency, maybe maybe they were maybe the the long before there was a FBI, there was a Pinkerton National Detective Agency. The agency was established in the United States by Scotsman Alan Pinkerton. He was, at the time, the largest private law enforcement organization in the world. Historian Frank Morin writes, by the mid-1850s, a few businessmen saw the need for greater control over their employer employees. Their solution was to sponsor a private detective system. Pinkerton's agents performed a variety of services for the people who hired them. Basic security guard work, strike-breaking, private military contract work. During the labor strikes of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, businessmen hired the Pinkerton agency to infiltrate unions. Yeah, the homestead. Okay, I was... Uh, Pinkerton's hired the nation's first female detective. <laughs> they were like libbed up cops, dude. Um, They spied for the Union Army during the Civil War. He was a Union man and a staunch abolitionist during the Civil War. He organized secret intelligence for General George B. McClellan. Um, I think the reason why I'm getting it mixed up is because the... Yeah, as the chatter correctly pointed out... The earliest forms of police were literally slave patrols. And the earliest form of the FBI is Pinkerton's. So I'm mistaking the two. Now, obviously, the two, uh, you know, work hand in hand. But I think that's the reason why I, I was misremembering. Well, I didn't even know about them because Charlie said they were evil. But turns out they helped my people. I guess I was a sheep for this one. No, dude. What the fuck are you talking about? No, they are evil. What the fuck? Just because they were like. Just because the main guy was a a, a labor app, I mean, uh, not a labor, sorry. Just because the fucking dude was like pro ending slavery doesn't mean that he wasn't a fucking shithead otherwise. The fuck are you talking about? They literally are the uh, beginning of the FBI, okay? Do you know what the FBI has done to your people in contemporary history? The continuation of all the things that others did to your people? That's it. That's the whole point. No, you're being a sheep now. Anyway, he'd be like, yeah, let's uh, let's free uh, the formerly enslaved uh, African uh, people here so that we can fucking kill them when they try to unionize for a corporation that they now work for. They sent escaped slaves back over the Confederate lines to spy on the South while Pinkerton was ahead of the security apparatus. That doesn't seem like a very nice thing to do. Okay, let's continue with uh, this video. So given that anti-labor work was a feature of the agency, what did Alan Pinkerton, the former chartist and poor immigrant laborer, make of this situation? Writing in 1878, Pinkerton argued that America's working class were negatively influenced by foreign political ideologies, namely anarchism and socialism. And through the strikes of these workers, Pinkerton contended the true working spirit of the honest laborer was being destroyed. For Pinkerton, the American worker didn't That's go awesome. about his betterment the right way, as though Allen himself wasn't motivated by similar ideologies when he stormed Westgate Hotel in 1839. And though Pinkerton himself may have become conveniently forgetful in his old age, the workers surrounding the Homestead Steelworks were all too aware- Oh, okay, thank God. Holy fuck, they're actually talking about it, luckily. ...of who the Pinkertons were as they began to land. As the agents neared the factory, shots rang out. The strikers responded with everything they had. Bullets, stones, burning oil, burning rail cars, and even shells from a cannon. And in the Battle of Homestead, the Pinkertons reaped the consequences of decades of labor abuse, false accusations, surveillance, and testing. They were overrun. And when the Pinkertons attempted to surrender, the strikers shot down their white flag. Eventually, Union leaders accepted the Pinkerton surrender, with several dead on both sides. And as the Pinkertons laid down their arms and disembarked, they walked through a gauntlet of angry strikers who beat and berated them as they moved from the river. That's of awesome. Of the 300 Pinkertons who embarked that morning, three were dead and the remaining 297 were injured, either from the battle or the gauntlet that followed. Although the Homestead strike ended in another labor defeat, it also tarnished the reputation of the Pinkerton Agency. In 1893, the U.S. Congress passed the Anti-Pinkerton Act, limiting the government's ability to hire private investigators or mercenaries. Although this law didn't apply to private corporations, it did give the federal government increased oversight.
Yeah, they do like security management now, don't they? Check my log. It's about Pinkertons and unions today. Pinkertons haven't changed. Oil capital, sheet metal, V sheet metal, workers, local 270 show Pinkertons investigating salts. I dealt with them as both a salt and organizer for the Teamsters. Yeah, they still do corporate espionage. As a union man of 19 years, the son, grandson, nephew, and cousin of Teamsters, machinists, UAW, and electricians, a former Teamster organizer and salt and current machinist, I hope every Pinkerton shows self-love and remembers to kiss themselves before bed tonight. Yeah. Um, I've never done this and won't do it again. Please check my logs. Pinkertons haven't changed. Uh, oil capital sheet, uh, metal V sheet metal workers, local 270 show Pinkertons investigating salts. Salt for those machinists. Is it not machinists? I don't fucking know how to say it. Listen, man, I'm a bougie, bi-coastal elitist motherfucker, okay? I hate you, chatter. Just wanted to say that a lot of engineers, especially in the Cali area, do in fact make over 100k a year. And the convo the other day that engineers somehow don't make over six figures was fucking laughable. I'm sorry, just wanted to clarify. If you make less than 100k as an established engineer, that's because you chose civil or mechanical or are just fucking stupid or incompetent. Engineers make that bag. You will never make as much money as I do for the rest of your fucking life, no matter how hard you try. Fuck you. Okay, how about that? Imagine calling a fucking dude who uh, is, is like his lifelong dream is literally making fucking spaceships stupid or incompetent because they didn't become a fucking cloud or software engineer or computer engineer like you, you fucking dipshit. Shut the fuck up, okay? Go back to your IT job until it gets fucking completely rewritten by AI then, you non-solidarity having dumb cocksucking motherfucker. Dumbass comp side dipshits being like, yeah, I'm a STEM lord. All the other STEM lords are dumber than me. Hassan, why are you so tough on smart people? Yeah, that guy was really smart. Fuck you, idiot. Maybe because I talked about my brother not making a lot of money and, uh, and, and not making 100K as a fucking dude who builds spaceships for the goddamn, uh, one of the most significant manufacturing, uh, uh, you know, manufacturing houses for the American government in general, for the United States of America, in general, and this dumb fucking comp size shithead comes in 24 hours later to shit on him to be like, oh, he's so stupid. He's just too dumb. He's just too dumb. That's why he doesn't make as much as I do as a fucking code monkey. Shut the fuck up. My brother's also an engineer, and I can also be ridiculously catty. It's so fucking stupid. And the reason why I brought that up the reason why I brought that shit up literally was to say meritocracy isn't real. If that was the fucking case, then a fucking engineer who was like significantly smarter than me would be making way more money than me. Okay. And this dumbass fucking idiot still comes in here to be like, I make more money than the fucking saw so as a software engineer than I do with fucking then, uh, you know, dumb mechanical or civil engineers do. Both of those jobs are incredibly fucking dignified, you piece of shit. You're talking to a fucking Twitch streamer that you've given $25 to over the course of fucking five uh, months to learn a fraction of fucking leftist concepts. And you're still in here flexing about your salary to a dude who literally makes more than you do in a year in a fucking month. What's wrong with you? While we're talking about fucking meritocracy being a lie. Holy shit. Insane that even in the fucking STEM field, I understand the disdain that so many fucking STEM lords have towards people that do like, you know, social shit. Okay. Oh, Pauly Sai, lol. Uh, you know, that's not real. We should just eviscerate the arts in general, not realizing how important that is for, you know, a lot of the aspects of humanity that you take for granted, okay? And then you fucking turn around and you shit on even other engineers at that point because you make more money than them. You're a fucking idiot. No idea why you're triggered. He was saying engineers make money. Why are you upset? Here's what I don't understand. I don't know if you guys are in the same fucking Discord, uh, Splinter Discord cell or something, but, like, how can you be so fucking stupid? Like, do you not understand? My brother is an aerospace and mechanical engineer. I was talking about how meritocracy is a fucking idiotic notion, an idiotic concept, considering that he makes significantly less money than I do and less than $100,000 a year living in California as a dude who literally builds fucking rocket ships. I find that to be a laughable concept. This fucking dipshit comes in 24 hours later 
to literally be like, no, your brother's actually a fucking idiot. I'm a software engineer and I make so much more money than he does. Okay. I'm an engineer too. I know all of you. I'm not going to lie, dude. A lot of you motherfuckers have like actual dumb, dumb brain disease. Okay. You do. You can like, I don't know, build a fucking remote or whatever the fuck you're doing. But when it comes to like human comprehension of speech, you literally are operating at like a third graders level. It blows my fucking mind. And I know this because I live with one. You know what I mean? My brother is the same fucking way half the goddamn time. It's insane. Trust me, when I ask him how he doesn't know how to spell yet, he's going to say, I'm an engineer. I don't need to learn how to spell. I've heard it a million times from my fucking dyslexic ass brother too. I don't need to learn how to spell. I'm an engineer. Fucking who cares? I know you do. It's like a meme. Anyway, it's so weird, dude. 24 hours later, Chatter comes in to fucking shit on my brother. Of course I'm going to pop off like that. Especially when he's coming from the dumbest... Like, the dumbest fucking take possible. What an absolute fucking baboon, dude. I work in a similar capacity to your brother. This industry literally runs on underpaying and overworking smart people who will accept it because it's a childhood dream for most of us. People who aren't in the industry don't know. Exactly. I see it. I know it. I live it. He just wants to fucking make spaceships. That's it. So he will just take a mountain of shit every fucking day, like a a, a 1%, 2% increase in his salary, uh, that that ends up being like you know a seven to eight percent pay cut in general every year because he just loves doing the job. That's it. He just wants to make spaceships. So if you come in here with your dumbass fucking ticking time bomb of a job and be like, "Puh, I make more money than he does." Fuck you. You're a piece of shit. There are so many fucking jobs in this country that are severely and significantly underpaid because they rely on the better nature of the human beings that have taken on this incredible task. Nurses being one, teachers being another one. All of these jobs are historically underpaid. The only reason why I brought up the engineering uh, subject matter is because a lot of people think that engineering is historically a decently paying job. In the United States of America, even engineering, even satellite uh, engineering is not, aeronautical engineering, aerospace engineering is not, uh, as well paying of a job as you think it is. That's it. 70k a year is great though. No, it's not. Not for Los Angeles, California. It's not. That's so weird, man. Especially because, like I said, it, it's so dumb to come in here and be like, dude, I make more money than your brother because your brother's a fucking dumbass. It's like, okay, well, I make money more money than you and your dad combined. Does that make me smarter than you? No. So shut the fuck up. Like, imagine thinking your salary is tangibly tied to, like, anything meaningful, like, that you are contributing to society or how fucking smart you are. Site over the activities of the Pinkertons and similar organizations. The agency was never the same. The story of Alan Pinkerton and his agency is a story that touches on so many important topics in 19th century America. Capitalism, immigration, industrialization, labor unrest, slavery, and ideology. And it's a tale that has echoes today in its warnings about the dangers of private policing. But it's also a story about a complicated man who went on an incredible journey. One that a poor boy living in Glasgow might find too incredible to be true. Special thanks to our educational tier patrons, Ahmed Ziad Turk, Joseph... 70k in LA is like barely living category rather than the just surviving category chatters. Yes. Anyway. Very weird, dude. I mean, when 14 year olds can make more than entire bloodlines just from TikTok lip syncs, it's kind of clear your career salary doesn't mean much in regards to character and intelligence. Thank you. We are on a platform where the number one fucking revenue generator eats his toenails on a daily fucking basis. Okay. Okay. And like plays Minecraft speedruns and will never defeat Forsen's 1810 record for like 16, 17, 18 hours. And you're over here, like, you're over here being like, no, you, how much money you make is like directly associated with how intelligent you are. Especially in like, brother, I literally live in LA, but 70K, 70K does allow for decent living in LA for a young professional though. Um, it, it, it's entirely dependent on what part of LA you live in and what your living circumstances are. I literally make medical devices for a living and don't make uh, 100K. Um, 
you know, everyone has different uh, circumstances, but 70K in Los Angeles is not like poverty wages or whatever, but it's not exact. You're not exactly fucking, you know, flush. You're definitely having a hard time coming up with rent if you want to live by yourself. And I know that because I lived through that. And uh, I was more comfortable when I had two roommates and making like a 65K to 60K salary. But certainly when I moved on my own, uh, that was impossible. So like you have to remember that, you know what I mean? I live uh, in LA. Do you have any roommates? Because if you're living comfortably with 70K in Los Angeles, you probably A, have roommates and B, have a job that doesn't require you to have like a dramatic uh, commute. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's almost always edge cases regardless. 